So I'd like to welcome everybody to this afternoon session on critical thinking and clinical decision making. We're going to have three topics. Um, the first one will address sort of clinical decision making and looking at some of the challenges of interpreting the uh, statistical uh, uh, different statistics used in the research papers because interpreting that is a challenge. The second topic will address uh, critical thinking uh, and how we make our clinical decisions as emergency physicians. And the third topic is going to address how we take this evidence and how we actually operationalize it into clinical decision support that we can use at the point of care. So to start with, I'm going to introduce Dr. Chen Guang Fu. He's an emergency physician from Chang'an Memorial Hospital. He's my co-moderator. And he's a physician scientist who got his PhD, Johns Hopkins, in studying the flu. And so Guang Fu, take it away. Okay, thanks for coming to this section. And as Michael introduced, I will first introduce you some uh, clinical reasoning regarding the must-know and the pearls. So this is gonna, going to be a, a relatively easy trip, so hold on. So first of all, I'm very, I, I gotta be regret to say I don't have no conflict of interest with Claire. So let's start with a scenario. A 70-year male visit to your ED on the last day of the Lunar New Year vacation. As we know that the New Year, New Year is uh, always the most busy uh, period uh, for our ED. And this gentleman is triaged into the level four of TTAS, which is the low acuity level, and with complaints of fever and general malaise since the morning. Uh, plus uh, cough, sore throat, and general soreness, and had a past history of asthma. So what do you think? What do you, what, what do you want to order? So the uh, physician just ordered first the rapid antigen test for the flu, and it turned out to be negative. And unfortunately, the uh, lab, lab is able to uh, I do the PCR test on the specific day, but it turned out to be equivocal, very unfortunate. So the gentleman just uh, received a supportive care and uh, was discharged home with uh, no neuromediates inhibitor subscribed. Although I don't, I don't want to talk about this because Michael obviously uh, is very against of this therapy, which is very you know um, prevalent in Taiwan. And uh, it turned out to be the patient progressed to revisit your ED four days later and develop severe pneumonia in ARDS and finally expire 10 days after admission. Is that a normal or common scenario you're going to see? Is there anything we can do uh, by uh, using our clinical reasoning and uh, maybe decision making support? So, the outline today is first to define and uh, maybe give a little bit why is that important to uh, make a good clinical reasoning and or uh, clinical decision. And uh, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about how to evaluate a, a performance of diagnostic, diagnostic tests, what's those kind of bias, those jargon, spectrum bias, misclassification bias, uh, verification bias. And lastly, I want uh, to have a little bit of time to touch base uh, on the clinical gestalt and why is that important uh, to your decision making aid. So you may or may not already uh, hear the talk that Dr. Holland, Hollander gave uh, regarding the Watson that IBM is trying to develop a new no matter server or in the future a uh, very uh, you know, uh, achievable goal. So as you can see in this clip, uh, maybe uh, in the future, we could utilize the technology to assist our decision making. But what what it is uh, different is the uh, you know machine is still machine. So uh, you still need a clinical judgment uh, to to help your patient. So uh, in able to do that, you need to have the capability 
to solve problems, make decisions, especially when you order a test, you need to have your clinical reasoning. So according to some, it is uh, actually the major domain of clinical competence. And why is that difficult? It's because you need to incorporate different uh, skill or knowledge, including uh, epidemiology information, uh, clinical intuition, uh, history of physical, and or laboratory examiner results. So you need some basic or essential knowledge from clinical epidemiology to refine uh, those decisions. So let's start with the performance of diagnostic test and why is that important? So spectrum bias, what's, what is spectrum? It could be uh, the different uh, period when you see the patient. Is that the, during the, uh, the season, like this gentleman just visit your ED uh, at the peak of the epi um, an epidemic? Or because the patient is very early at the stage of the illness? Or just because the specimen you order which is uh, uh, could be one of the bias that uh, uh, introduce. Uh, so let's review the two by two contingency or the nightmare table for you. So some physician or resident need to memorize it, but um, uh, just remember that the sensitivity is the proportion that tested positive among the diseased. So the clinical term would be the highest. If you have high sensitivity, you you are able to rule out specific disease. But sometimes physicians prefer the positive predictive value. Is that intuitive? Because you only know that uh, the patient are tested positive. You, so sometimes you want to know that uh, what's the proportion of the uh, positive predictive value. But I'm, I'm going to show you that that's a uh, very dangerous uh, action by using uh, P PPV only. So. Uh, Let's see what's going to happen during a non parallel period. Just uh, treat the size of the alphabet as the size of the sample. So during the non parallel period, you have mostly healthy patients. So that won't influence any uh, performance of your sensitivity or specificity. But your positive predictive value will you know, be bad, and the negative predictive value will be good. On the other hand, uh, during the prevalent period, you will have a good positive predictive value, but the bad negative predictive value. Let's uh, review our patient again. The gentleman just visited your ED during the prevalent period, and you just uh, happen to use the, the negative result, try to rule out the patient, and it's going to cause a disaster. So how about the date of illness? illness? Um, uh, many research has indicated that uh, Day of illness has uh, much influence to your uh, viral shedding. For this specific study, you can see uh, for season flu or the novel H1N1 influenza, you will have the highest viral load on the second day of illness. So in another study performed in Taiwan about three years ago, uh, it, it is the result for one specific uh, rapid antigen test. And it turned out to have very low sensitivity on the, third, the first or even second day of the illness. And how about the site of specimen collection? Uh, for the season of flu, it's usually rep, uh, easily spread and uh, rarely fatal. But for the avian uh, uh, flu, uh, not, uh, influenza A, H5N1 species is spread more slowly but often fatal. But the key issue is that is uh, sometimes when clinician collects specimen from the upper tract, it could miss the influenza virus. So how about the site of collection? Um, you use nasal or oral, you use swab or wash. So according to this study, uh, you can see the most sensitive specific, maybe single sampling method is from the nasal pharyngeal wash. You can achieve a, almost a 0.9 six sensitivity, uh, and that's uh, also one of the protocol we adapt for our influenza research uh, project nowadays. Okay, so let's move on to another issue, which is the cutoff decision. There's uh, mainly two type of methods to choose cutoff. One is the conventional way, the other is the, I said it's preferred method. So the first one is very, very familiar, just uh, 
uh, sometimes you only have one cutoff. For example, it's troponin level. So uh, some researchers use UDEN index, which is the maximum uh, value of sensitivity plus sensitivity minus one. And by doing, the, doing so, you actually treat sensitivity and specificity uh, as the same important level. So what's the preferred uh, method? Uh, you could use several cutoff. So you may know that uh, now many researchers recommend two cutoff values for uh, both uh, BMP and PCT. And uh, what can we do by using different weights? Um, just uh, I don't want to, to explain too much about the, the formula, but just to show you that uh, you could just minimize the cost of the misdiagnosed case or, or the false negative cases uh, plus the uh, false positive cases. And of course, you can uh, give different costs to those values, but that's very sophisticated calculation. Um, maybe as the uh, emergency physician, you just want to use sensitive uh, cutoff to rule out your patient, and maybe specific cutoff to rule in your patient. All right, so that's just the theory. Uh, let's see the result uh, from some digital review. This is also one of the posters we presented, uh, uh, we're gonna present tomorrow regarding uh, the uh, performance of uh, lipopolysaccharide by the protein as a biomarker to diagnose sepsis. And uh, here, just uh, illustrate that the different cutoff the researcher gives in uh, this specific uh, finding. And what's interesting me most is that there's one example saying uh, this study used the, the highest cutoff but still have the highest sensitivity. So sometimes we need to figure out what's going on in those studies. And this is another study for flu. So this is document up uh, from FDA trying to compare different PCR assay. Uh, as for some who's not uh, familiar with the PCR uh, test, the CT value is actually the cycle threshold value. It's almost uh, very close to a continuous value that you could use that to have a different cutoff. Say for uh, uh, normally uh, people use 40 as the cutoff for a sensitive result. But for this specific uh, assay, just use 37, which is going to cause the false negative for uh, those uh, two concentrations of the, this uh, virus strain. Okay, so let's move on to the verification bias. So why is that, and why is that important? Uh, still, for flu, uh, there's one uh, meta-analysis and uh, systematic review that try to summarize the accuracy of a rapid influenza diagnostic test. And when you are reading these articles, you just find something you don't really understand. They're saying because of our inclusion uh, criteria, most studies were free of partial verification differential verification, and incorporation bias. So what is verification bias? Still use uh, this study as the example. So the, for the rapid influenza diagnostic test, uh, say this is a real situation, you have 650 patients included, and uh, this re the true sensitivity is actually uh, 84, and the specificity is 74. But because this is an observational study, so um, for those <coughs> tested positive, they tend to be uh, verified by PCR assay. But for, for those negative, maybe the clinician just discharged them home. So let's uh, use this hypothetical number, and you can see in the following slide, the total uh, uh, test positive patient decrease, I mean, for, for the rapid influenza diagnostic test, and the sensitivity just uh, is falsely increased and the specificity is falsely decreased. Use another diagram, for example. The shadow is the one who's not verified by uh, maybe clinician, maybe researcher. So uh, as you can see, it's always uh, uh, not verified differentially for those uh, tested negative by the index test. So that's the reason uh, the verification bias will falsely increase uh, the sensitivity in most studies. Okay, uh, let's talk about precision measurement. Remember the gentleman's triage is the level four 
uh, acuity level, and during that specific day, he may be waiting for two hours to be seen by the physic uh, clinician. And you know, sometimes we just uh, the clinician or the physic are very angry because we sometimes think the triage nurse is not doing their job good. So uh, precision or uh, reliability or reproducibility is also a very important parameter uh, to, to know. So for uh, there's one specific study that uh, tried to compare different triage nurse in terms of uh, their performance in doing their triage task. And this, res this res study just concluded that uh, the overall kappa statistics is 0.35, so the, the triage nurse is doing a lousy job, so they need Michael to come in to improve their uh, triage capability. So is that true? Is kappa a really good statistic? Is there any other uh, method? Before we talk about kappa, we need to mention the percent agreement, which is very intuitive. Percent agreement is actually uh, between the two tests or rater or whatever you want to compare. You just uh, 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 have the, the total agreed uh, number divided by the total number, which is the, the percent of agree, positive or negative. Is that a good one to use? Again, the prevalence issue come in. So if you have a, a, a population, say most of the uh, patient or uh, you know, participant are negative, so you will still have inflated percent agreement. So one of the solutions is take the cell D out and just measure uh, this uh, percent agreement. But sometimes another issue is, uh, you know, if you compare a test to a coin test, it will still have a 50% uh, agreement. So the kappa statistic come in and try to solve the chance agreement issue. So here's the uh, triage example. Uh, say we have four level of triage data database here. So you just, you just did your uh, you know, elementary school calculation. You find out the percent agreement is only 81%. Actually, I'm sorry, 81.3%. 81 and the kappa statistics, because you just uh, uh, take out the expected percent agreement, which is actually 31% in uh, this study, and you have the kappa 0.73. So, hmm, what's the that mean? One of the issues that kappa has uh, is uh, uh, different researchers have different recommendations. You could have a five level, or six level, or even three levels of the category to uh, different uh, confidence of the kappa statistic. And uh, kappa, again, will be influenced by the prevalence. As uh, illustrated on the, the left-hand side is the, I would say, is the uh, prevalent study. And the right side is the non-prevalent study. So they have the same percent agreement, but different kappa statistics. Another issue is, uh, Again, uh, is tri uh, triage level three very different from level four? So one of the solution is you can have different weights for the kappa statistic. So that uh, for this specific example, uh, I would say that triage level one or two is uh, you know eighty percent like the triage level th three. So by doing so, you will have the similar uh, kappa value as the percent agreement in this example. All right, so uh, the final one is the clinical gestalt and uh, clinic, uh, diagnostic prediction aid. So clinical reasoning is not only statistics or numbers. You still need your experience to do some uh, you know, interpretation or you still need to uh, use your intuition to see if the patient is going to have events or not. So for this uh, meta-analysis, uh, Perform uh, in uh, 2006, they just compare uh, physician versus the scoring system in predicting mortality in the intensive care units. And it turned out the clinician is doing much better. And as you can see in the, this ROC curve, also in the final plot. And interestingly, clinician is doing better years after years. So we ha also have a small uh, study to try to see if uh, uh, emergency physician is good 
uh, at uh, you know um, diagnosing debitor confirmed bacteremia, and politically <laughs> correct is uh, the clinician always had hundred percent sensitivity, but uh, unfortunately, the positive predictive value is only twenty eight percent. So let's go back to our scenario. So this patient just visited on the uh, the busy uh, Lunar New Year and the triage level. Oh, you know. It might be reliable, might be not, but you need to go back to see how's the performance of your units or how's the performance of the TTAS. Uh, and uh, because the gentleman just visit on the very first day, and you may uh, need to consider using the test to exclude the uh, possibility of flu or not. And then you need to go back to see what's the cutoff value your lab used for the flu test and you may need to reconsider the disposition of this patient. Okay, so I hope you are not too dizzy, too dizzy by after my uh, uh, illustration. So do we have uh, any time for a question? Uh, 